Good morning, and welcome to the Being Found show, the best two hours in radio for your business. If you're listening to this show, you do have a better chance of being found by more buying customers. After all, they are looking for you. You just need to be found. It's going to be a good show. You can always uh, find out more details about the show on beingfound.com. We'll have articles, more helpful tips, links, resources, all that kind of stuff. We are also trying to be creative and bring you support in just about every way we can think of. So there is typically a video of uh, my screen or other parts of the show and things that we're talking about, reports and things like that, that you can see at beingfound.com. The idea of this show is it is your internet helpline. We're trying to make it easy for small businesses to thrive in this new e-commerce economy. We're going to have some neat things happen in the show today. But first off, you might notice that I'm the one talking and there's no one else jumping in over me. It's because I've fired Sean and Chauncey. Okay, I'm just kidding. Uh, they're both on break. I, I didn't fire them. And as a matter of fact, I tried to sneak in here and get on the show without them around. So... I can have all the time to talk. So you might want to go ahead and turn off the dial because even as I'm listening to some of the interviews I'm going to play for you, I don't really have a voice that's that fun to listen to. So uh, I hope you'll stick around, although I completely understand if you don't. But it's going to be neat. There's a, there's a guest we've had on the show a couple times, Rob Redding from Redding Design Inc. He's a web developer, online marketer runs a, a, a decent sized web development company and is out of Canada, not out of Reading. Interestingly enough, the uh, he's done such a good job at search engine marketing that we found him here in Reading. He's going to be on the show. He's going to talk to us about what it takes to market and some great projects, fun things he's working on. He's always a really fun guy to talk to. Uh, also, we talked about the interview last week with Kate All from Simple Pin Media. We're going to play some of that interview today. I think that Pinterest is one of those platforms that's standing out as a, a way for businesses to be found in, in more and creative ways. You know, after talking to Kate, one of the ways I think that Pinterest can work for businesses is in that inspiration phase. You know, think of it when you're a customer and you're looking for how you might want to reorganize your garage or um, what kind of cupcakes to make or, or things like that, even before you're really thinking about what you're going to buy and you're just trying to figure out how you want to, um, how, how you want to make something happen or you're looking for inspiration. Uh, businesses are using Pinterest for that, but also Pinterest people are pinning and posting things that they think would be inspirational or helpful. So anyways, Pinterest is interesting. I, I think you'll really like that interview, and that's later on in the show. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about a little bit is e-commerce and search engine optimization. I'm actually going to play a little video real quick that you'll be able to see online or hear on the radio. Helen Overland from searchenginepeople.com did a training video on Shopify.com. And, and I came across this video, super helpful. I think she does a really good job of setting the stage of why we even care about who Google is and, and what's going on. Her, her This is uh, e-commerce SEO 101. There's a whole bunch of courses there. You can go to Shopify.com slash videos and you'll see all kinds of training. It's a, just a fantastic resource. But there was one in particular I really liked. And, and, and the topic that she's covering here is, why is your store not on Google? Now, the interesting thing is, is she asking you that? Or do you also ask yourself that? Do you wonder why you're not being found on Google when you Google yourself? Or when your customers are Googling you? What's going on? What she does in this video, well, I'm going to let you listen to it, but what she does in this video is she breaks it down to who Google is and understanding who Google is is what makes it make sense. So I'm going to get started here. Many times business owners wonder why their site isn't ranking in Google. And you have to think about 
what is Google? Google for any particular search has millions of pages that it could rank and really only the top 10 of those millions of pages are the ones that gets to rank in Google. So what Google's really trying to get at is the 10 most valuable, most useful, most helpful or interesting um, search results that uh, will serve the, the searcher's needs out of those millions of results. So, Okay, let's take a break here for a second on this. If you're like me, I, I, I've been here when I'm trying to be found on Google and it can get overwhelming. Right now, go Google your own business or your own products or services and there's a chance you'll see hundreds of thousands, if not millions of results. You just look right at the top of the Google page and, and you'll see all those results. So it gets, it gets a little overwhelming to think, well, <laughs> this is dead. There's no way I've got the time, effort, or energy to compete against those millions of results that are going to show up on Google. So if you're if you're like me, you're listening to that, you go, "Oh no. I got to compete with all that." Well, in a way that's that fear or that concerns true. But also, Google is doing a really good job at, and, and working really hard at making content relevant to the user. She's going to go over that here in a second. And so there are factors that play into the results that are going to show up for your customer. Like, where are they compared to where are you? Um, or what specifically are they looking for? If they're looking to buy shoes in that moment and they're looking for a shoe store, well, you're probably not going to be competing with a shoe store in Sacramento or a shoe store in LA. You're going to be competing with shoe stores in your area, which is a little bit easier to handle, right? So don't get overwhelmed. Okay, let's continue on with her interview. So when you're looking at search results, you have to look at your pages and think, are my pages better than that million, two million, 10 million results that Google could serve up? So one thing that Google has been very consistent on is knowing who their customer is. Google's customer is the searcher. They've been very consistent about this over time. Um, if Google can make sure that their searchers find what they're looking for as quickly as possible, then Go people will keep going back to Google to find what they're looking for. And that means that Google has a big audience that they can serve ads to and they can continue making money and be a profitable company. So Google's focus is on making sure that the customer gets the most valuable and useful page that they can. So what Google's... Okay, let's stop there for a second. Again, this is that uh, idea that... I'm competing with millions. This is scary. Google's going to find someone better than me. I'm not really that good at that. I, I, I don't even know what my web team is doing with my pages. Those kind of concerns. Well, it's true, but remember what she's saying is that Google's trying really hard to serve up what people want. And there is a lot of things people want that is near them or very specific, in which case, if you are doing the right things, you have a really good chance of being found, especially if you're taking that one little extra step to see how it's going. I think that's kind of the missing part. As a business owner, you can actually see how each page is doing. You can actually test your pages and see if they're built the way Google would like them and make small adjustments or have your web team make small adjustments. Let's say, for instance, that you want to be found for uh, olive oil. Well, and let's say you have a page on your website selling olive oil or a product selling olive oil. Well, you can actually look and see where is that page ranking in Google? Is it ranking 1, 2, or 1,000, right? Are you number 30 on the Google results or are you number 2? You can actually look. Google makes that available to you. The, the next thing you can do is you can, you can look at that page and go, well, what can I do better? And even if you can't make the changes, there are tests that you can use to make the changes. And it, like always, you can call us. Uh, you go to beingfound.com, get our number, and you can call us. You can, you can Google it. How do I test my page to see if, uh, if it's doing well, if it's going to be found, if Google's going to like it? So don't be so worried about the million places. It isn't like winning the lottery. It isn't throwing a page on the internet and hoping it works. You actually can make sure you're doing the right things. All right. Basically done is they've created this environment where people compete to be the most useful page 
for their Google's customer, Google's searchers, which means that in order to win this competition, in order to be the top 10 out of these millions of pages that Google could serve up, you have to be better than all of those other pages. You have to be the most unique, the most interesting, the most valuable, the most useful page out of those millions of results. See, you know, and this is what gets me about these. I, I think she does a really good job of making sense of, of this. The challenge here is that she's talking to, well, she's doing this thing where they generalize. We see this a lot where when an expert's talking about this stuff, they're generalizing how good you have to be to beat the whole world. Well, you don't have to beat the whole world if your customers are in Shasta County or if your customers are in Tehama County or Redding. You have to beat the people in Redding and in Tehama County. So although I love this interview and you can go to shopify.com slash videos and see more of these videos, uh, check it out. I really think you should. There's a lot of great information. I don't want this kind of thing to scare you away from taking the right steps now to compete where you are. Okay, so you're listening to The Being Found Show. We're in our first segment. We've got a great show, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Being Found show. Now, right now what I'm doing, well, I'm alone. My whole team left me. Uh, no Sean, no Chauncey. Apparently they have better things to do on a weekend or especially a holiday weekend. As a matter of fact, I didn't even realize it was a holiday weekend. So they know something I don't. Either that or I fired them, which isn't true. Okay, so... Our goal is to pull back the green curtain and make all this stuff make sense around the internet. And, and we want to make so that you, local business, can put the internet to work for yourself instead of against you. So whenever I come across really helpful videos or articles, I like to share them with you. Now, what's really neat is Shopify, which is a e-commerce platform, which is growing out of control. And I mean in a good way. Shopify is a great way right now for you as a local business to get your products online and sell them. It's a it's a website or a, a store builder. It's really inexpensive. But anyway, Shopify is really doing a lot to help businesses figure this stuff out. And so they have training courses. I've come across this training course, e-commerce SEO 101, SEO as in search engine optimization. There's a lady named Helen Overland who's doing these videos. She appears to be from searchenginepeople.com. I think she's doing a great job. As a matter of fact, I'm a little jealous when somebody can explain the internet so clearly and I, it takes me two whole hours to get one point out. So what I want to do is I want to play another one, a little excerpt from another one of her videos. This one is uh, key things to look out for. Now, this is really interesting because she's going to talk about the penalties that uh, or the mistakes that you can make that would make so Google actually doesn't want to share your website. And these are mistakes that pretty much anybody who's who's been around the internet or been following it all Google, they end up asking me about them. Things like Panda and Penguin and duplicate content and those kind of things. So I think she does a great job explaining it. So I'm going to go ahead and play that video. And, you know, always stop by beingfound.com. Tell me what you think. Give us a call. You know, tell me if you don't like the what we're sharing or somehow I've got something wrong. I want to hear it, good or bad. But anyways, here we go. Let's get this going. So when you're doing SEO and you're starting off doing SEO on your website, one of the things that causes some concern is the potential for getting hit by some kind of penalty or for going awry of Google's rules. So let's talk a little bit about some of those rules and, and some of the ways people do get, get into trouble when they get a little bit aggressive on their SEO. So one of the things that people sometimes do is they will get really aggressive in terms of the number of links that they're creating to their website. Yes, links will help you rank as long as they're high quality, relevant links. But when you start getting links on websites that have nothing to do with you, for example, if you sell 
earrings and you're getting links off of jog jogging sites that's not really a relevant link if you get too many irrelevant links if you start going into people's blog posts and spamming their blog uh, comments with links back to your site if you get caught buying or selling links on your website or if you hire somebody to do link building for you and they do it in a way that's just not above board that's just not in the way that is helpful to Google searchers, then you could get hit by a penalty. For example, one of these penalties is called the penguin penalty. Now, one of the ways that you can get your site ranking in search engines for specific keywords is to create links back to your website that use the anchor text of the keyword you're trying to rank for. Now the anchor text is that word that you click on in the link, the actual link words. And what people were doing, which is why Google created, created the penguin penalty, is they were creating thousands of links back to their website, all using the same anchor text because they wanted to rank for that number one keyword. So what this did is, is this obviously was encouraging spam to happen in order to help people rank better in search results. And that's not really what Google wants to encourage. So they created something called the penguin penalty. Basically, if you get too many links to your website, and it really has to be too many links. You're going to know when you have too many links to your website. Okay, let's stop there for a second. Are you going to know if you have too many links to your website? Do you even know what links are linking to your website? Did you know you can know? There, there are tools out there uh, like Moz, M-O-Z dot com, Alexa dot com. Uh, uh, interestingly enough, Alexa is made by Amazon, or excuse me, not made by Amazon, was purchased by Amazon and uh, is a, a great tool that will actually tell you which sites link to you. Now, what they do is they crawl the internet and they store that up. But also, there's a free tool we talk about all the time. It's actually made by Google. It's called Google Webmaster Tools or Google Console. Same thing. Uh, Google Console, Google Webmaster Tools. That is a completely free tool. Your web developer or yourself, if you're savvy, would put a little snippet of code in your site, and now that tool starts to track what's going on with your site and the rest of the internet. It's the amazing thing about this tool. Google Analytics and other tools will show you what's happening once someone hits your site, but what happens out there in the search world? What happens out on um, Google results page and Google Webmaster Tools will tell you that. And one of the things it'll tell you is links to your site. So you can actually go into Google Webmaster Tools and you can look for that. And again, we'll always help you find Google Webmaster Tools or get, get Google Webmaster Tools into your site if for some reason you're having a problem with that. It's no problem. It's free. We'll just help you get it in right away. Don't even worry about it. You can always check us out at beingfound.com or give us a call and we'll handle that for you. But it's a super important tool and you need to do that. All right, let's get back into the, the video. You're all using the same keyword that's not your brand name over and over and over, then you might get hit by the penguin penalty. So one thing that, you know, to watch out for is when you're building links, a lot of your links should be to your brand name or should be to your URL. That should be the anchor text, the clickable words in the links back to your website. If you have far more links to keywords to your website than you have to your brand name, then you might be at risk of the penguin penalty. And what happens is you simply stop ranking for those keywords that you have too many links for. So don't go overboard. Always try to make sure that the links you're building into your website have actual value. You, that somebody going from that website where you're getting the link to your website would actually say to themselves, oh, that's an interesting site I just found or an interesting store I just found. So that's one way to stay on the right side of Google's rules when it comes to link building. Now, when it comes to content, one of the problems that um, Google ran into a few years ago is uh, something called duplicate content. And it's exactly what it sounds like. It's when content or text is copied on multiple different websites. So this used to be a big problem a few years ago when um, 
People were going to other people's websites, copying their content, putting it on their own website, and then ranking their own website using the stolen content. So obviously this was encouraging spam and Google doesn't want to encourage spam. So in 2011, Google started penalizing sites that publish content belonging to somebody else. So this is why it's important to write your own product descriptions. And this is why it's important to write unique content just for you. Okay. I don't know if you're like me, but if you have 5,000 products, 1,000 products, or 100 products, or even 10 products, if you're listening to this show and you just went, what? I don't even like to write, or which is why I do a radio show, because I don't want to write a blog. Or that's, I don't have the time. I don't have the time to write this stuff. I have 1,000 products. There's no way I can write out content. Okay, let's, so let's just step back for a second and, and realize that you don't have to do it all at once. Basically, what she's pointing out here is that Google gets it. They know that that you may not want to write all your content. And so they know that if you can, and if your manufacturer allows you to use content they're already using, that you will. And for Google, that's all worthless content because their user, um, I, wh why not just send them to your original manufacturer? Why even send them to you? And so also when she's talking about spamming or being extra content on the internet, Google doesn't need to index 4,700 times that the same product has the same description in 4,700 different websites. It needs new content. So you got to do this, but you don't have to do it all at once. Do just one product. Just do one product a week or a month. And I got to tell you, there's all kinds of ways to have people from uh, Fiverr, there's something called Fiverr.com, or Upwork, or Guru.com, or Freelance.com. Those are all places where you can hire writers, and you can hire them for inexpensive. Some of them will do it for five bucks, 10 bucks, 20 bucks per product. So you don't even have to do it. So, but, but don't look at your whole list of products and think, oh my gosh, I gotta do this for all of them. Just do the ones that are selling the most or the first two or three or one or whatever, and then get them online, get them on a web page, get them out there where Google can find them, but take her advice and make it unique content. Okay, we are up against the time here. We're coming to our next break. I so appreciate you listening. I hope this is helpful. You are listening to The Being Found Show, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Being Found Show, the best two hours in radio for business. Okay, so, um, you know, there's no doubt things have changed for businesses and uh, how they grow and how they market and, more importantly, how customers find us. The internet has just gone out and... and uh, basically put the customers in charge. It's given them power, it's made so they can do what they need, what they want, um, in order to buy what they want, find what they want. And so, you know, Google, uh, if you ask me, Google's doing probably the biggest study in consumer behavior and the longest study in consumer behavior than has ever been done in the history of the world. And um, Google came out with a term that they call micro moments. Um, so if you're a business, or you're running a marketing department um, and Google says, hey, there's this new thing out there called micro moments. And micro moments are what uh, your customer is, um, is doing to make decisions to buy. Well, if you're running a business or a marketing department, seems like we should understand what that means. Um, after all, if Google's laying it out for us and saying this thing's happening, then we should at least step back and look at it and see what it means. And so I wanted to go over an article that Google wrote in uh, July this, this month, 2017. It's called Micro Moments Now. And, and it goes on to say it's the three new customer behaviors playing out in Google search data. So keep in mind, Google watches everything people are doing. Um, now, I got to step back and say that because when I'm talking about being found, it's not always 
about being found in search. There are other places you need to be found, social, email, all these places. But because Google's watching everything everybody's doing, and because we're all using our phones and our computers to search or solve problems, that means that Google probably has a lot of valuable data so we can understand what consumers are doing. So that's one of the reasons I go to um, Google resources, whether either the reporting tools I have access to or their research and papers they've written in order to get an idea of what's going on with customers. So this particular article is uh, Micro Moments Now, Three New Consumer Behaviors Playing Out in Google Search Data. So these are things that Google has been um, watching happen. So what's really interesting is Google, in this article, goes on to say that they they feel like, or, or their data is showing that this thing called micro moments is happening more and more and more. They're seeing it grow. And essentially what they mean by micro moment is um, that a user is now going to the internet or to search in micro moments. So for instance, if I'm hungry, I might go to my phone and say, where's some food near me? Or if I'm on my way to go shoe shopping, I might say, what are the best shoes to buy for chubby feet like mine? Right? So, so in other words, we're now using the internet and search uh, in our little moments, in those little tiny moments. And um, so why do we care about this? Well, we need to be there. You know, as businesses, we need to be there in those micro moments. We need to be there when someone's looking for a restaurant near us, um, et cetera. So now, these three behaviors that Google's laying out in this, I just kind of want to go over them a little bit um, and uh, and go over this this report that Google came out with. But But let me also say a few numbers. So one of the things that Google's noticed in this report is that mobile searches for best have grown 80% over the last two years. Now, here's what's interesting to me about that. Um, for one, what does this mean? Well, this means that I, I'm. I, it's not good enough for me to look for shoes. I want to know what the best shoes are. I want to know what the best toothbrush is. Um, if I'm gonna if I'm gonna hire a marketing company, I want to know what the best company is. So that's what Google means by this. That that putting that term "best" in front of what you're looking for has gone up eighty percent in the last two years. But what else is that telling us? Well, <clears throat> that's that's telling us something that I've seen for also the last two years as I look at the statistics in my clients' websites is I'm looking at the back end of my clients' websites and I'm watching the behaviors that are, that, that are happening with, with their customers. And frankly, about two years ago, the world just seemed to change. I'm not kidding. If you thought you understood marketing, if you thought you understood um, how to grow a company or revenue um, or how to run a website, if you thought you understood any of that, it all changed two years ago. It, it just did. Um, I, and I, I guess maybe some of the factors that led up to this change was everyone got cell phones in their hands. Um, there were some changes in how cell phone plans worked and things like that. So we all got more of them. Smartphones got smarter. You know, I don't know. There's probably a lot more reasons than that. But the reality is that the world changed. What happened was this micro moment thing. What happened was that we now had this supercomputer in the palm of our hands. Um, we had our cell phones, our iPads, our computers. Heck, my, my laptop's so small I can walk around with it like it's a, almost a piece of paper. So we all got these little things in our hands which allowed us to, frankly, get the answers that, that we're looking for. And, and so I've seen that with our clients' websites is we see this giant shift from people coming to a website using a desktop to now we see them more and more all the time are coming with a mobile device. Um, and so, and you got to think about that. If, um, if they're more are using a mobile device, like this says, mobile searches for best have grown 80% in the past two years. Well, part of that's just that we're more of us are using mobile, but we're also using it 
better and, and we're using it more often. And so as a business, do we recognize that? And do we recognize that there is a different um, intention that comes with this new mobile device, right? There's a, there's a difference between when I'm on my laptop and I'm, I'm thinking about what kind of uh, a bicycle rack I want to buy or what kind of shoes I want to buy um, versus if I'm in motion, if I'm on my way somewhere or I got some time to kill and I pick up my phone. You see, there's a there's a difference in, in intention. As a matter of fact, later on, this report goes to point out um, a large number of people who actually buy, who are more likely to purchase something. Uh, I'll just skim down a little bit. Um, there, It's something like 50% more uh, who are on a smartphone are more likely to purchase immediately. So the, all that changed, this, this, this superpower that now consumers have changed everything. So that's one of the, um, that's one of the, the, the different behaviors that Google is recognizing here. And that's the right here customer. Um, there's a well-advised customer you know, they, they know what they're doing. They know what they're looking for. Um, there's a right here customer. And I'm actually, I want to read this, what Google says about the right here customer. Um, so essentially, Google says, several years ago, marketers were able to deliver the type of relevance by taking explicit cues um, people gave them, for example. So in other words, marketers we're able to uh, know exactly what to market to you because you wrote something extra in the search box. Let me give you an example. For example, if someone wanted to find a sushi restaurant nearby, do you remember doing this? You'd search sushi, and then you'd give your zip code, your city, wherever, or you'd say even near me. So this is saying, that's what we used to expect. And now as a, as a marketer or, or as a business, you might still think that happens. And, and maybe it still does for some of us. But what they, what they basically say is they've upped the ante. So um, here's what's happened. The expectations of, of how a customer wants to search is now they just want to type in sushi. What? They just want to type in sushi and they want your phone. They want their phone to know that they're looking for sushi to eat nearby or that they're looking for the times a sushi restaurant might be open. Wait, that doesn't seem fair. Well, it's, it is what it is. And why is that happening? Well, that's happening because the apps that they're using, the mapping app, the phone, the, the, the power of the program and the device they're using is getting smarter. So that phone now knows where they're at. See, the laptop may not have known where you were at, or your desktop may not have known exactly where you're at. So you would have to have typed in that um, you're looking for sushi in your zip code. But now that phone knows where you're at. And, and it's, it's connected to things like Google Maps, um, Apple Connect, things like that. So since that phone knows where you're at, you don't have to type that anymore. So now you just have to type sushi or, or even better yet, you say sushi. And now as a consumer, my phone has gone to work to find out where I'm at. So I'm going to be coming up to the end of this um, segment and uh, I'll continue on in the next segment. But what we want to be thinking about is, are we there? Are we being found for the right here customer? You see, there are actual physical things you have to have gone and done. You have to have made sure Google and, and other of the monsters know your address and that that information's in right. So it's telling that app where you're at. So it's telling that smartphone where you're at because when that person puts in sushi, you may have hoped that your page was being found for sushi 96001 zip code. But if you didn't tell the monsters, then it won't know. So we'll be right back. You're listening to The Being Found Show. Thanks so much for listening. Welcome back to The Being Found Show. Best two hours in radio for small businesses, local businesses, and all businesses. If you're listening to this show, you got a better chance of being found by more buying customers. I'm telling the truth there. Um, okay, so in the last segment, we were talking about uh, a um, blog post and a study Google's doing, and I guess always doing. They're, they're studying our customers basically by watching all their behavior. Um, you know, when you're looking at a website, 
Google is watching how long you've been on that website. They're watching what pages you click on, what pages you like and you don't like. Um, I know that sounds a little creepy, um, but it's true. They know where you are, where you live as a consumer. Well, what's incredible, though, is Google makes all that information available to businesses in something called Google Analytics. So we can actually look at Google Analytics as a business, and we can see if customers are liking our site or or if they're... Um, you know, if they're, where they're coming from, what pages they're clicking on, how long they're on the site, what devices they're using, all that. But I think sometimes that's a little overwhelming. And quite frankly, looking into Google Analytics, if you don't know what you're looking at, can seem like just a big sea of data. So what I like to do is I like to look at some of the studies that Google's done where they summarize the um, some of the information that they're finding. So they're helping us understand what, what we might also see if we were looking at our own um, Google Analytics. Okay, so what I wanna talk about in this article is what Google's calling micro moments, uh, the three new customer behaviors playing out in Google search data. That's, that's what this um, article's all about. And right now, um, we went over uh, the right here customer, but, but what about the right now customer? And what Google's telling us is that, um, there is a customer who is expecting to get the answer they want right now. Um, let, me, let me just read a little excerpt from what Google says here. Um, ever needed a restaurant reservation at the last minute? What about a hotel room or a pharmacy? People turn to mobile more than any other source to help them get things done, make decisions, or purchases. And every day, people are becoming more uh, reliant on their smartphones to help make last minute purchases or spur of the moment decisions. In fact, smartphone users are 50% more likely to expect to purchase something immediately while using their smartphone compared to just a year ago. Now just think about that. Um, compared to just a year ago, when you're thinking about um, your marketing uh efforts are is your concept of what you should spend on marketing or what your website should look like or how users are going to use your website is have you rethought it in the last year um or, or are you still working on a marketing idea or a concept of how your website should work or how users might find you online from two years ago, three years ago. You know, Google's got all the data we could ever want, and right here it's saying this is changing even in the last year. Now, sneak peek to this: what this article says later on is it talks about the fact that the one sure thing is that this is gonna be happening more and more. And if it's changed even over the last year or two, well, what's gonna happen in the next year or two? How much faster? Is this going to change? Um, so what do we do about it? What, what is this right now customer? What's, what's going on there with this right now customer? Well, you know, that's one of the reasons that uh, the, this behavior is, is one of the reasons that we started the Being Found show. Um, you know, it's, it really, being found by a customer isn't just about search engine optimization anymore. It's also just not about a website. Um, but also, it's it's actually not super complicated. Um, your users are using their smartphone and Google and Bing and and Yelp and all these places to to find answers. And so instead of just calling it search engine marketing, uh, concepts. What, what, what it really is, is it's about being found. So what do you do about it? Well, have you been asking your users, excuse me, your customers, how they found you? Um, but let's take it a step further because this isn't just about being found for the first time. This isn't just about being found, um, you know, in at that very last moment when someone wants to buy, even though that it's happening there. It's what about when they need help with a question that they're trying to figure out if they even need your service or not? Are you found there? Um, what about when they're mapping 
They know to come to you. They want to go to you. They don't even have to find you to know you're the store they want to get to. But can they find you on the map? Are you being found when they go to the map? Is it the right address? I cannot tell you how many customers, clients of mine, that um, will show them what the internet thinks about where their business is or their hours of operation or their phone number, whatever. And, and they get mad at me because what's on the report isn't even their address. Their, their address they're being found for is, is a, a, someplace that they had their business two years ago or 10 years ago or five years ago. And I'll just say, hey, don't get mad at me. I didn't say you're there. At some point, you didn't tell the internet that you weren't there. So are you being found when someone knows who you are and they're, they're heading to your place? When they go to map you, are they going to find the right place? Are you being found when they're in your store and they want to compare your prices and they pull up the phone and they say, they, they say, compare prices. Are, are you there? Are you online? Are your products online? so that they can compare. They're going to. Um, you know, I think that's one of the interesting things that uh, I hear a lot is that, well, I don't know if I want my prices online because, um, you know, I want the customer to come see me and I want them to come to the store and I want them to find out about it. Well, they can find out prices for your products online or your services. Somebody is saying prices for products and services. And if price is an important factor, if you're not being found online where a customer can look at your prices, you're essentially out. You're, you're out of the running. So with this right now customer who's pulling up their phone and they're going, I want to I wanna find shoes or, or, or I want to uh, uh, find a, a nice restaurant um, or whatever, you, you know, whatever it is, a camper shell. Well, if price matters to them, and they're looking and they find several places and one of them has a price where well, there's a good chance that might be where they go. Um, or there's a good chance they're going to go to you already knowing that other store with the prices online. And so now while you're working with that customer, you don't even realize that they have a baseline for prices. So, you know, the question is in this right now moment, have you found out from your customers what it is that they're looking for in that moment. What are they looking for in all of those little micro moments that lead up to purchasing so that you are being found? And are you asking where did they use Google Maps to get to you? Um, did, they, did they see your address on Facebook? Um, you know, you might even ask them where they find your competitors. But it's, it's not always good enough just to talk to your customers because they're your customers. They found you. What about the ones who didn't? Uh, you know, so, so are you going out there and asking friends and family and people you run into, hey, when you're looking for something online, where do you go to, to find an address? Or, or where do you go to, to find out if, if it's a store you can trust? Or, or what do you even look for when you're online looking to make a purchase? Because... <laughs> You got to find out what those customers are doing and looking for that aren't finding you just as much as the ones that, that are finding you, right? So what do you do about this? Well, I think this is more about a mindset change than any one specific thing you have to do. I mean, I, there are the basics. You know, you have to be in the Facebook directories and the Google My Business directories, and you got to be in all these directories, which I, I feel like a broken record that I'm always talking about. You got to be in those um, because they're they're part of the foundation of what the internet uses to figure out who you are and where you are for those customers that are physically looking for something near them or the apps are assuming. Um, but but you do have to go a step further and and you have to find out what what are those decision paths that exist when a customer is deciding to buy your product. And you have to ask yourself, are you being found in those? Let's let's use camper shells, for example. Well, sure, someone's looking for a camper shell. But are they looking for the best camper shell for hunting? Have you made sure 
that you're being found for the best camper shell for hunting? Are they looking for um, a steel camper shell versus an, a um, fiberglass camper shell? Are you being found for those things? Are they looking for a camper shell for a Ford truck? Well, is your camper shell that you have in stock online as a product so when they're Googling and looking for a camper shell for a Ford truck, they can see yours? What, I mean, why are you making them come all the way to your location and browse your lot when they could have just as easily looked for that camper shell for a Ford truck from the comfort of their home and come to see you? Chances are there's not a whole lot of camper shells nearby for a Ford truck. So had your products been found, how much more likely would it have been that they came to see you? Right? So... That's what I'm talking about when, when we're talking about being found and we're talking about um, these micro moments. Uh, so, so this right now customer, it doesn't mean they're ready to buy right now. It, and, and they may, but it does mean they expect the answers right now. And so you do got to step back and say, well, am I, am I figuring out what those answers are? Now, when I say all this, okay, Joe, let's say I, I, I know all those and I want to get them out there. How do I do that? Um, well, admittedly, it could be as complicated as you want it. Um, you know, you can, you can create a blog, you can create a website, you can post it on Facebook. Um, but ultimately, I think if you just step back and, and think of it as what, what I call limited risk marketing, which means you're not going to spend or do any more than, than makes the absolute most sense and, and you can afford to lose, um, what you do is you start by getting into the monsters, you start by getting into Yelp and Google My Business and Facebook, um, and you fill out your profiles completely. You make sure your phone number, your address, everything is in those as best it can be. So at least they're going to work for you. Um, they're helping you be found. And then from there, you have to some decisions to make of what you want to do with your website and if you want to put your products online with an e-commerce platform. I'm always happy to go over those things in detail with you. Um, but okay, so we're coming up to the end of this segment. I hope I'm making some sense of micro moments. I hope I'm making some sense of what Google's telling us customers are doing and what you can do about it. You are listening to Being Found Show, and we'll be right back after this break. Okay, welcome back to the Being Found Show that I am sure is the best two hours in radio for your business, so I'm glad you're listening. I'm here with Rob Redding from Redding Designs. Um, he is an online marketing company or runs an online marketing company, and uh, he's basically opened up the green curtain and telling us all about everything we need to know about that kind of thing. And uh, Rob, I was going through your website, Facebook, things like that, and you have some really cool projects going on. Um, can you update us on some of the projects you're working on? Yeah, so um, yeah, currently on our on our portfolio page, we've been doing uh, uh, quite a few things, everything from uh, uh, employment services, uh, one of the, the towns over from us here. Um, you know, that, that was a custom um, Laravel project actually, where we gave, uh, they have access to add, add jobs. Um, everything is, is tracked in the back end. People can apply for them. Um, it's a really user-friendly uh, custom content management system that we built built for them. Uh, locally at the Elmer Fair, right down the road from where we are, we help them out every year. And uh, so we just did a rebranding and a re, uh, refresh of their website this year for the, the fair. They do other things throughout the year here at Elmer, but uh, just a small organization that we help out uh, here in town with uh, keeping them online. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there's a couple of... Man, we do everything. So. <laughs> yeah, how many of these? Um, how many of these websites or these logos I'm looking at in your portfolio did you design? Like, you obviously didn't design Cobalt Banker. Do you? Are a lot of these your guys' designs? Like Johnny's um, Restaurant, most, or I would say, well, obviously all of them on there are, are, are web or web design. But the logo design is uh, um, not. I don't think they're going to be on all of those ones that are on there. Um, we uh it's funny because most people will come to us and they've already got their their logo and their branding down and so we take it from there yeah uh, a lot of a lot of startup companies smaller ones and, and we don't have a lot of that listed on our on our uh, website but um 
you know, they're coming to us with nothing. And then that's what, when we create everything uh, for them from scratch. Uh, but we did finish up a few, I think on our Facebook page, there's one for uh, Yoga Beans Yoga. Uh, we developed her logo. Um, there was one for a, a trucking company that's on there. Um, but our clients are varied. We uh, yeah. we have clients in kind of all aspects, everything from, uh, you know, the, the local churches uh, here in town or right up to um, funeral <laughs> embalming companies and uh, everything in between. I mean, actually, we, do a, we do a website for a fresh start maternity. Um, so they help uh, young moms with babies. And then we have the uh, embalming agency. So we're from birth to death. We you are from a- birth to <laughs> death. That's funny. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, that's not funny. That was wrong. No, no, no. That. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's not funny. Um, I'm going to admit that I, I am a little surprised that somewhere on here is not some reference to Strange Brew. But, you know. That's just me. I'm sorry. Yeah, we'll we'll we'll, we'll get a, a little something in there for you. Thank you. One of the one of the cool things that we're we're working on, uh, we we developed a uh, project management tool um, um, for property managers. Uh-huh. Uh, we have a client um, in town just down the road from us. They seven or eight different uh, uh, townhouse complexes. So we created a whole system for them to have online maintenance requests um, sent in, and then they can push those out to their maintenance guys. You know, anytime there's something up for rental, they can post it live to their site. And we created a whole uh, kind of back-end management system for that. And we're actually looking at uh, pushing that out as a white-labeled um, standalone software to uh, for people that have small um, properties that they want to manage and have one kind of software for it. So lots of lots of exciting things coming down the, the Okay, line. that's okay, that's, that's a direct. That's oh, a direct oh, I'm echoing. Am I okay? Am I okay? Right? You're fine on my end. Well, I'm echoing on my end. Um, Oh, well, listeners, you'll have to listen to me twice there for a second. Uh, So that's an interesting thing. I hadn't planned to go on this on this um, interview. But when it comes to problem solving for a business, Mm -hmm. us web developers um, and online marketing companies, we actually can create applications to solve those problems because so much now uh, is able to be built as web applications. That's exactly it it's not just about a front end website anymore. There's, we can help solve problems, right? Yeah. We have another, we have another uh, local client here in town that opened a catering company and uh, they offer um, meals. That's a flat rate for a meal for four. And uh, you sign up the, the day before and then they will cook it and you come and pick it up the next day. But we're creating a whole online ordering system for them. Right. Um, because they were using Facebook and, uh, it was working for them, but they were starting to miss messages. And you got so many different ways of communicating through Facebook. So we're going to streamline all of that through a web app for them that will take all their online orders, dump it into a database. They'll get a text notification that the order came through and the, uh, the person placing the order will uh, get a confirmation email as well. So yeah, yeah. We're sol- we, we solve problems that uh, people are having and uh, create web apps for them or, or whatever they need. Yeah. That's a cool side effect of, of uh, you know all this web technology and 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 learning how to operate it all and it's, it's and half just, the, time the, the the business doesn't even know they have a problem yeah right? and until you, until you can say well here's a here's a quicker more efficient way to do it and then then they realize okay yeah we have a problem let's uh, let's get on this and, and make it better so yeah okay so I want to ask you some questions this is the you asked for it segment okay uh, and uh, don't worry nobody ever gets these questions before. So you're being put on the spot just like everybody else. (laughs) Um, Okay. So the first one is about web design. And so here's what we do. Some of these questions people ask us, sometimes they're questions that I'm asked during the week. And I think I'll make note of that um, and make sure I cover it in the show. Um, And so uh, this could be coming from anywhere. So one of the questions I get asked a lot is how does web design affect SEO? And I think that's a big question. I don't even think they always fully appreciate how deep that question is. But but how would you say that web design affects SEO? Yeah, I mean, I, it's kind of a loaded question. Um, so, I mean, obviously, within the development of the design, the code, uh, the, the text that's being used in the content and the copy is going to d- definitely re- uh, affect your SEO because you got to have your keywords in there, the phrases that you're trying to want to hit, um, that kind of stuff. And then even, you know, with the, the design, you've got a little bit more so as far as 
your your domain name. Uh, you know, Google now is starting to preference sites that have the SSL security certificates on it and right. rank them a little higher than non-SSL sites. So the the design um, will have some impact, but I think it's still more the content, the uh, the things that you're doing within the code, within the the internet. Um, uh, side of things uh, as far as the domain and your host and that kind of stuff goes. Yeah. Um, but good design all around is just going to be better because you have a good design, more people are going to come to your site and it's just going to help the rank, right? So. Yeah. And see, that's, that's exactly why I think it's a loaded question because you and I instantly go to knowing that there's a lot more going on in design than what people think. So, mm-hmm. so, when, so when a customer asks or, you know, a business goes, I, I want a good design, they're thinking that the colors match and, and that it looks awesome. And they feel like they're looking at something that represents their company. Great, which matters. Yeah. But, but, but there's a whole lot more into the design of how that code looks behind the scenes is, are we using a bunch of JavaScript stuff, which is slowing down the site? Are we loading yeah. stuff from other sites? Right. So there's a whole lot to it that makes that, that bot of Google and all those other ones either have a good time or a hard time crawling and figuring out what, it, what it is. So, you know, yeah. Well, and, and the other aspect too, is what's the, what is the site being used for? Right? Like if you're, if you're using this as a lead generating site, then you need to make sure that even the layout is going to be um, beneficial for lead generating as opposed to just an information site. Yeah. So, and then, and then how you alt tag everything so Google can find those, those well. I mean, there's, it's, yeah, it, there's a whole ton of uh, underneath stuff. It's, <laughs> yeah, it is sure. crazy. Okay. <laughs> okay. Here's another big one. Okay. Where is web design going? You know, so, and I get this question because I get it that I don't get it. Um, mm. be- because, you know, we've got, we've got $25 a month web builders. Now, you know, you can get Wix and, and all those things, which by the way, you know, they fit, they can work for people. You've got, um, you've got, uh, my kids who almost never go to a website. Everything's done with either an app or on their mobile device. Right. Um, yeah. you know, so there's a lot of moving parts right now. There's a lot of big shifts in, in the world. So what does that mean for web design? Where do you think it's going? Um, definitely, definitely the mobile route is the, the huge thing. So having, I think web design, making, uh, making sure the web designs are fluid, mm-hmm. that no matter what uh, kind of what device people are on, it's going to be presented well on all devices. So having a fluid design, but you know what, I think the, the app kind of stuff is, is going, we're looking into developing, I mean, we've developed a few apps around here that are, more specific um, parts of a website. So mm-hmm. uh, for instance, a company wants a job board. So we develop a web app for the mm-hmm. job board that's part of their their normal site. So right. they're able to kind of pull things apart. But uh, honestly, I mean, the VR thing is getting huge these days. So who knows if it's gonna, we're gonna turn into some, you know, VR style websites where you can kind of walk around somebody's online presence and. Yeah, and kind of walk through a website. We've been toying around with that idea around here as well. So, um, but the trend the trend right now is just very clean. Everything needs to be clean, quick, and easy to get through. Yeah. Uh, you know, the days of tree navigation where you hover over and it it spiders down forever. That's that's gone. People want to be able to just click once, maybe twice, and get to where they're going. Right? Or they're so, gone. Or they're gone. Or they're gone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And fast on sites, man. It's got to look fast because if somebody's sitting there longer than three seconds, they're, they've moved on. Yeah. And it's, that's one of those things that I, I feel like a broken record or I'm like chicken little saying, no, your site's not fast enough. You got to make it faster. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the business will say, well, it's fast enough for me. Well, you just don't know how many people are leaving no. your site. And if they're leaving your site, Google doesn't want to show your site in its search results. Cause it knows people are going to leave it. It's, it's, it's a, there's a giant, um, um, rolling effect, right? Yeah. And, and that's the one thing that we constantly tell clients that you just kind of hit on it there a little bit where you said, well, it loads fast enough for me. The biggest problem we have is trying to get clients to take their emotion out of it. Out of it, yeah. Right? And it's, you know, our goal is to make this for, for their clients, their customers. What do they want to see? Not necessarily what the client wants to see. The client might want to have a dozen bouncing pink bunny rabbits come across the screen because they yeah. love bunnies. Yeah. But if you're trying to sell a car, you don't need to sell, you don't need to pick buddies coming across the screen. So no, well, and the cool thing about your method, and it's, it's, it's probably one of the main reasons that, that we like to have you back on the show 
is that you believe it is customer first, not mobile first. And, and that's, we believe it. We've done so much research, it's sickening. Um, mm. and, and the bottom line is a business can trust that their online marketing will work if they trust that the idea is to make sure it's what their customers want. Yeah. If, if, if the business is going to trust that their board of directors or their managers or their president or their CEO knows best, you can almost guarantee it is not going to work, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, okay. So we are coming, as a matter of fact, I'll tell customers the one thing I'm sure of, or I'll tell my clients, the one thing I'm sure of is you're wrong right now. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> um, in my office, right? So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so we are coming up to a break. Uh, Rob, I'd like you to stick around for one more segment because um, you talk about something on your website that we've touched on a little bit, but I want to go into it more, and that's your spider work, your internet services. Yeah. Um, because, you know, to me, those decisions are kind of hidden in the background that um, really set the foundation of, you know, everything, your online marketing, everything. So I want to get back into that. So will you stick around for one more segment? For sure. Okay. You're listening to the Being Found Show and Rob Redding from Redding Designs. We'll be right back. Okay. Welcome back from the break to the Being Found Show. I had a chance about a week ago to interview a Pinterest expert named Kate All. I'll tell you what, that was a great interview. I learned a lot about Pinterest, and I want to play that interview for my audience. So I don't want to waste a lot of time here. Let's just get right into that interview. So uh, this is probably going to be one of your most 101 discussions into Pinterest because I am like dying to figure it out, right? Okay. <laughs> and I don't get it. I've spent my whole life understanding this stuff, and Pinterest is eluding me. So I'm going to ask some probably really basic questions um, and like you said, we're just going to go where it goes. Okay. Great. That works okay. for me. All right. Well, so, um, Kate, why don't you <laughs> officially tell us who you are and what you do? Yeah, I am Kate all, and I run a Pinterest management company called simple pin media. We're based out of Portland, Oregon, and our goal is to manage the, our Pinterest presence or our businesses Pinterest presence for them. So they can grow their business online. So we basically take over everything because they don't understand Pinterest and we do. Right. And so our goal is to extend their reach using that social platform because a lot of people don't get it. No. And so do you actually do the creative? You do scheduling, the whole thing, right? Yeah, we do scheduling. We don't do as much creative. We have very few clients that require that from us. A lot of them are really good at their creatives. Mm -hmm. And so they're able to get a handle on it or they're able to hire that out to something like Upwork or Fiverr or something like that. Mm -hmm. So then we take their creatives and we do all the scheduling strategy, all of that. Yeah. Okay. So um, I'm going to jump around. Okay. Uh, but one of the first thing that's completely caught me off guard while I was doing research for this, um, I also was having my clients coming to me telling me, Joe, it's crazy. Right now, Pinterest is my number one source um, other than Google. Or they're saying, we're not putting any effort into Pinterest and we're converting more sales from leads coming from Pinterest than every other source. I don't even get it. How is that happening? <laughs> I know. Isn't it crazy? A lot of people yeah. think it's the platform for food and weddings and <laughs> right. hair and nails. It's kind of like the girl platform, right? Yeah. And so a lot of people do open up their analytics and they're shocked and they think, how in the world is this happening? Yeah. And what I always tell people is that Pinterest has evolved a lot in the last seven or eight years that they've been around. And what they really want to be is a search and discovery platform kind of like a search engine, but not, they would be careful to call them. They wouldn't call themselves that. Okay. And they're also careful to straddle that role of social media platform. They mm -hmm. don't want to be known as that. So Pinterest really is this place that people go to plan, curate ideas or to save things for the future. So if you're a typical user and you come across a helpful article or video, the best place online to save something is Pinterest. And then when you save it, everybody else sees it. So then somebody else might find it helpful. So it's become this place that you go for ideas and you get images. Whereas Google, you know, you go there, you search and you'd see a lot of text, but people right. are visually, they visually connect with people and Pinterest provides the ability to do that really easily. Okay. So let's try to break it down into the two 
major types of interest in Pinterest. One is I'm a business and I want to use it to make money, right? Or to, to engage with my audience. The other is that uh, I'm, I'm a Pinterest user because like you said, I'm going to curate or I'm going to, I'm going to find the things I'm interested in. I've even now started finding all kinds of stuff. And I don't even know what these boards say about my personality, by the way. Um, <laughs> yes. That's a whole nother discussion. Yes. But okay, so yes, we've got yes. those two groups, right? And so at, at the high level, I get the, um, the, the person who's curating, looking for information. As a business, my first question is, so how am I using this? Do I want to get people to pin me? Or do I want to be pinning interesting things that I wish people saw, you know, how is this, how's that, how's that basic idea work for a business? Okay. So let's take an example. Cause I think it's always best to have like a tangible example. So let's say okay. you're selling tents and you're an outdoor company and your specialization mm -hmm. is creating tents for um, families, right. ones that don't break and they're big, you know? Mm -hmm. So your goal is not only to show your helpfulness by getting people to pin your pins and eventually buy it, but mm -hmm. also creating on your boards a little bit targeting that lifestyle. So mm -hmm. maybe you don't necessarily do any content around camping tips with kids, but somebody else does that you could partner with. And then mm -hmm. eventually even they could be a partner that talks about your tent. Mm -hmm. So you're doing a little bit of both. You're showcasing your content, but also kind of showcasing other stuff. So you, so if I hop onto your Pinterest profile, which is your Pinterest page, Mm -hmm. I see you're about tents, but you're mm -hmm. also about families. You're not about backpacking because very mm -hmm. few families go backpacking, right. but you're definitely geared towards the family that goes camping. Okay. So I was listening to an interview with you. It takes me to the very next question. I have notes, but I knew this was going to happen. I knew that you were going to lead me through this. Um, uh, so I was listening to an interview with you, uh, Manly Pins. The guy who oh, yeah, it. Manly Pinterest tips. Yeah, yeah, yeah Manly Pinterest tips. Um, and, and he was talking about this very same thing about, you know, the how he's got the persona and, and, and he's doing things around the idea. And, and I started wondering, if you're doing that, does, does Pinterest also work where you can specifically sell the product on Pinterest, which I think you can now, can't you? Yeah, you and can. You, guys, you started talking about that. Um, so I want to talk about that a little bit, but before that, how does somebody search for um, uh, through Pinterest where they would find your boards? Is it are they searching for camping stuff? Are they searching for specific images and then they find a pin, an image, and then they go to your board? Is that how it works, or can they actually find your profile? Yeah, they can do both. So I'll back okay. up a little bit. So the okay, way good. that Pinterest is kind of designed is their, their algorithm is called a smart feed. And what this is designed to do is that the end user, you looking for this tent, whatever you're searching on a daily basis or pinning, Pinterest clues in to know, oh, they are interested in these types of topics. So if anywhere else on Pinterest, these things are pinned, we wanna funnel it towards your main home feed, right? right. So they're doing this based on keywords. Mm -hmm. So if somebody's going onto Pinterest and they're searching tents for families. Mm -hmm. If you, as the person who sells, sells tents, has those words on your pins, your pin mm -hmm. descriptions, Pinterest goes, oh, this matches this person. Mm -hmm. And so they're really trying to match up through keyword and eventually image search. Pinterest right. is huge into developing searches. So if somebody hovers over a tent image somewhere, even on the web, they want to pull up your your tents to show this person. So it's really like really designed to work based on keywords, which is Google. That's kind of mm -hmm. the way it works. So, you know, careful to say Pinterest is like Google, but it's very similar operating procedure in that sense. OK, so I'm I'm uh, literally on a mission to figure out what's changed for businesses, what stayed the same and what can you do about it? And I think a lot of times when I'm talking to an expert, I, I'm pretty aware of the reality that they're talking about, the application, they're talking about the methods. And so I just got to keep reminding you and my audience, that is not the case with Pinterest. So um, as you bring these things up, there's as the dots are connecting in my head, I want to share them. Because when you just said it's like Google and, and the keywords and things like that, I'm looking at my 
um, pins and what Pinterest is suggesting to me. I'm also noticing I'm getting emails where it's pushing out pins to me. So it's interesting because you say it's like Google and it is, but Google doesn't do that for you unless you ask for alerts or something like that. But basically Google doesn't help connect the dots for you. Google doesn't go out there and try to find out what you want and share it into your email so you can find out more information about it. And I wonder if that right there isn't one of the major reasons it's becoming so helpful to businesses, that that full loop of finding interesting stuff and pushing it out. That's a really good point. And it's something that I think is to Pinterest's advantage mm-hmm. because they do really want you to connect with the platform. They want you to use it to buy things like, we, you know, Jeff and I were talking about in that podcast about buyable pins. Mm-hmm. You know, right now, buyable pins you can get with any product if you use Shopify or Big Commerce. But they're, the mm-hmm. way you buy something on Pinterest is very easy but it's not quite natural. So, you know, we are very accustomed to buying on Amazon. I think what Pinterest is trying to get you to think that way, because how the Pinterest user thinks is short, a little bit short term, but a lot long term, which is why you get long term traffic. So a lot of your users might open up their analytics and see this was a pin that was pinned six months ago. Mm -hmm. It's still bringing traffic or a Mm -hmm. year ago. Then it's because it keeps cycling through the system because people find it useful and helpful. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so that's also an advantage for marketers is your pin could get picked up and it could drive traffic for a year. Whereas where else can you see something drive traffic for a year? Right. And it's more of a curated experience with, with Google and, and content on the site. You're, you're competing. You're not working with, other pieces of content you're totally competing to get up there what i'm noticing as you're describing is pinterest you're, you're almost more collaborating so that you're included with pins but or on boards and, and things like that but but also i'm looking at a myriad of different images that are all different but have some relationship together and so i'm mm-hmm. not specifically competing if my pin was on this board i'm not specifically competing with any one of them because it's, right. it's all related, right? That's very yeah. different compared to the fight for number one, two, or three in Google. Yeah, and you know what's interesting is that Pinterest hasn't given us a whole lot of information about how you rank higher in search when somebody mm-hmm. search for, searches for things. So you are left to figure out, what is my audience engaging with? How do right. I create more of that? If this image with these certain colors or not using faces or long shot or whatever it is, is doing really well, that means that's working. Whereas with Google, you're kind of trying to, you're trying to rank high and there's all these ways to kind of game the system, but you don't want to game the system. Right. We haven't quite figured that out with Pinterest. There isn't really a way to game the system. Yeah. Okay. So you brought up also in that interview, targeting, Um, targeting your customer. Okay. So I just got to step back for a second and go, how? We're going to take a break from the interview. Take a break to listen to our sponsors, and we'll be right back. Welcome back to the Being Found Show. Don't forget, you can always find out more about the Being Found Show at beingfound.com. You can follow along with the show. Uh, We've got all kinds of articles there helping businesses figure out how to navigate this complicated world around the Internet. Um, Right now, we're playing an interview I did a week or so ago with Kate All. I hope you're learning as much as I did. And um, I hope that you are okay listening to my to me talk on the interview. You know, it's kind of ironic. I don't actually ever hear my voice after a radio show. I don't listen to my recordings. And as I'm going back to edit the uh, previous interview, I'm trying to figure out how I can get through the interview without having to listen to my voice and just, just listen to her voice. Besides, she's saying all the good stuff anyways. So anyways, I hope this interview's helping you out. I hope it's helping your business be found. And let's get right back into that interview. How, how do you target okay. pictures? How do you figure out who the people are? And, and in that interview, you were really specific that you have to target. This isn't one of those things where you can just throw spaghetti in the wall and hope it sticks. Yes. And a lot of so, people have done that on Pinterest for a long time. Right. Is they've pinned a bunch of stuff and they're like, it's, we're throwing darts and it's going to work. Now with your smart feed algorithm that we have over there, 
you're thinking, who is my end user? What are the mm -hmm. keywords that they're using? If we're back to this tent example, mm -hmm. are they searching for big tents for families of eight? You know, like getting very specific in what they would be searching and using those keywords on your pin descriptions. Mm -hmm. That's how it's going to get matched up. And the more you see a certain type of content take off, the more you look at those keywords and say, this is the route I'm going down. What's working in my Google Analytics? What are they they clicking through on? So the And that's when we follow that path. Okay, and so to be practical, then it sounds like what you're describing is I'm I'm identifying what keywords I think people are looking for, and then I'm looking at what kind of content showing up for that, right? What yep. genre, feel, con you know, all that, and then I'm using that as a channel to see if that's working with my audience, and then I try another keyword, and I and I'm real specific on channels. You're not saying that I can that there's analytics and Pinterest that let me say I'm talking to single white females who um, have $100,000 and want to go camping. That's not an option, right? Right. Not smart yet. You can drill down to um, location, mm -hmm. age range, and you can drill down to male and female. So you can and what device ad? they use. Is that in this ad? No, nope, that's shit? just in your analytics. Oh, I'll be darned. Okay. I haven't got that. Yeah. So when you do get to ads, you can target a little bit more specifically into okay. location, gender, uh, I don't know if there's age, um, language. So Pinterest is growing across the world. So you can target different platforms in other countries. And then you can ar also target your email list. So there's ways for you to drill down in ads, but your Pinterest analytics is gonna give you a high level information in addition to what device they're using. So are the majority of your users on iPhones? Or are they on desktop? That's really important as well. So I can see, so I'm looking at analytics now. I hadn't got that far. I'm looking at analytics and I can see impressions, saves, and clicks based on the specific content I shared, right? So that's mm -hmm. one of the ways I see how it's working and what it's doing. Um, how yeah, am I and doing? Then there's, I have one. There's people you reach too, right? In the middle, that middle section will give you more of the demographic information. Yeah, and I was about to get to that. I, I was going to ask you how I'm doing. I have one daily viewer. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, That's those, probably those, my those, sister. I know, right? Those daily viewers are sometimes skewed, though. So, right. Pinterest and Google, they aren't very good at talking with their analytics. So, we always right. trust Google a little bit more than Pinterest. All right. Okay, so let's get into some other practical questions. How often should a company pin? How Every often? day. Every day. Every day. And they're, they're, there's they're no magic pinning. number. It's just be consistent daily. Okay, and they're pinning content that's within their genre and then their own content as they can, right? Yes. Yep. Okay. And it, if they're pinning their content, a note that I think a lot of companies miss is Pinterest favors vertical images. So the long image as opposed to a square or rectangle image that Instagram or Facebook like. Pinterest definitely favors vertical. Are these questions too easy for you? No, they're good. Are they, are they, you're all right. Um, I'm good. Okay. So uh, let's say I'm a business and I'm getting started with Pinterest. First off, what kind of business should get started with Pinterest? And I want to kind of be, again, practical with my research information here because I, I looked up the statistics and I think it's easy to get caught in the numbers. I think there's 150 million or so Pinterest users versus the 1 billion or whatever Facebook users, right? Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's... A number of variants there. Um, so are there some businesses that don't belong going on Pinterest? I mean, is it obviously skewed to one type of user right now? Uh, or should anyone be on Pinterest? You know, I, I always tell people to start back with, um, are your people already pinning your content over there? And there's an easy way to see it. Either you can just search your website name, or there's a simple website you can do, go to that's Pinterest.com. Mm -hmm. slash source slash mm -hmm. your website name. So mine would be pinterest.com slash source slash simplepinmedia.com. And this lets you know the pins that are being pinned from your domain. Oh. And so I look here first to see, well, are, are, are people already sharing this? Mm -hmm. So I think there are, I think it works for the majority of the people 
I, mean, I would say that maybe a local dentist office who's trying to be very hyper local and target that audience might have a tougher time on Pinterest as opposed to Facebook. Mm -hmm. So I would tell them your efforts are probably best spent on Facebook. Mm -hmm. However, if you're a company that's selling products, services, or you're just looking to drive traffic, Pinterest is the place that you should be because the chances are that people are already sharing your content anyway. Right. Okay. So that's a good place to look to see if they're already sharing. And if they are, well, then it just makes sense to finish the steps and get on there, huh? It does. You know, there was a guy I was talking with, it was a couple of years ago now, and he really didn't understand the value of Pinterest, but he made handmade tools. So mm -hmm. these carved tools with these beautiful wooden handles. And he thought, I just don't think I should invest in Pinterest. And so I looked at Pinterest under his website and people were already pinning his products. There mm -hmm. was at least 150, 200 pins of his products there because people were saving them to gift guides to like what to buy for later. And it's like, why wouldn't you be there to further amplify that content? Cause your audience is already over there. So if they are already over there, follow them. Right. And that's a good point. I guess Pinterest is a place where even if you're not there, there may be an audience sharing your stuff already. I mean, well, also because the helpfulness, the nature of Pinterest is to be helpful to the user so that they don't have to bookmark their computer anymore. You know, we right. have like these, you know, bookmarks, but we can organize the content we want to save right. when we find it helpful. Right. So I use it all the time pinning things that we're building in addition. I use it all the time to pin a ton of lights I want to buy. And then I whittle them down to the ones I actually end up purchasing. And there's just a lot of usefulness in the platform itself that I don't think people realize people are already sharing your content over there. Right. Yeah, it's funny. So, so since I was studying this and started an account and started messing with it, I ended up creating a whole bunch of secret boards yes. for all my notes for shows and all the articles I want to read later. Right. It does yeah. become, it's way better than bookmarking. This is oh, better. so much better. better. And yes, do totally agree. And it's really yeah. good too. If you're looking for style inspiration, maybe you're mm -hmm. rebranding, you can go through and search your words that you're thinking and get inspiration that way. I love doing that to secret boards and that's yeah. really valuable because no one can see what you're pinning. Right. Right. Okay. So again, so here's some more like simple, basic questions. Thank you so much for listening, and I, I hope that interview with Kate All was helpful. You can listen to the rest of the interview on beingfound.com or our YouTube channel, Being Found. We are coming to the end of the show, but I thought before we end the show, I wanted to play you the video or the audio, if you're listening in on the radio, from Reading Design Inc. playing their very serious game, Bean Boozled Mondays. Thank you for listening. You have a great weekend, great holiday, have a safe holiday, and we'll see you next week. That fish one? Oh, that is awful. Buttered popcorn or rotten eggs? Oh. <laughs> and it looks like it is uh, these these yellow ones here. This one? Uh, the, you know no, this straight, one? yeah. Okay. That one right there. <laughs> the popcorn or rotten eggs? Yeah, that's rotten eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna get to test some of them up.